Niech będzie pochwalony Jezus Chrystus. Drogie siostry i drodzy bracia ze wspólnoty Magnifikat, spodobało się Panu Bogu zafundować nam święta paschalne w nowym wydaniu. Pewien jestem, że będą to prawdziwe święta paschalne. Zauważamy, że kiedy ludzi religijnych pozbawi się obrzędów, to się gubią, nie potrafią się odnaleźć, czują jakąś taką dezorientację i lęk. Tymczasem Bóg nie ogranicza się do świątyni ani do liturgii. Bóg daje się poznać tym, którzy Go miłują. Pamiętacie zdarzenie, kiedy drogą szedł kapłan i lewita i widzieli potrzebującego człowieka. Przeszli obok, bo spieszyli się na obrzędy liturgiczne. Być może tym wszystkim, co dzieje się teraz w naszym życiu, Bóg chce przypomnieć, że pierwszym ołtarzem ofiarnym jest ludzkie serce. Cudownie, że Jezus już uczynił chrześcijaństwo religią serca, a nie świątyni. Mamy dzisiaj ograniczony dostęp do kościołów, do sakramentów. Dlatego może warto pozaglądać, co dzieje się na ołtarzu mojego serca. Co tam się dzieje? Komu służę? Komu składam ofiary? Kiedy zwrócimy uwagę na historię zbawienia, zauważymy, że zwiastowanie pańskie nie dokonało się w świątyni, ani nawet w Jerozolimie, tylko w zabitej dziurze, o którym w Starym Testamencie nikt nie słyszał. Boże Narodzenie dokonało się poza miastem, z dala od wszystkich, którzy byli główni wtedy w religii. Dalej co? Śmierć Jezusa też miała miejsce poza murami miasta i była to pierwsza liturgia paschalna. Zobaczcie, bez dwunastu, bez apostołów, bez przyjaciół, bez znajomych. Ho. Teraz Bóg zaprasza swój Kościół do wejścia w Jego wielki tydzień. Niech to będzie wielki tydzień każdego z nas. Mamy wielką łaskę, by w nim uczestniczyć. Niech będzie pochwalony Jezus Chrystus. Kochani, witamy ponownie w Magnificat w wersji internetowej. Pragnę Was dzisiaj znów zaprosić do modlitwy, modlitwy uwielbienia, modlitwy Słowem Bożym, modlitwy, modlitwy całym, naszym, całym naszym sercem. Stoimy w obecności Chrystusa, jesteśmy złączeni z Chrystusem, modlimy się, łączymy się wspólnie razem, aby się wspierać modlitwą, abyśmy pamiętali, że jesteśmy wspólnotą, że jesteśmy razem, że zależy nam wszystkim jednym na drugich, także kochani, zapraszam Wam. Zacznijmy dzisiaj może od Słowa Bożego. Ewangelia na dzień, dzień dzisiejszy jest z Ewangelii Świętego Jana. Jezus powiedział do Żydów Zaprawdę, zaprawdę powiadam Wam, jeśli kto zachowa moją naukę, nie zazna śmierci na wieki. Rzekli do Niego Żydzi, teraz wiemy, że jesteś opętany. Abraham umarł i prorocy, a Ty mówisz jeśli ktoś zachowa moją naukę, ten śmierci nie zazna na wieki. Czy ty jesteś większy od ojca naszego Abrahama, który przecież umarł? I prorocy pomarli. Kim ty siebie czynisz? Odpowiedział Jezus. Jeżeli ja sam siebie otaczam chwałą, chwała moja jest niczym, ale jest ojciec mój, który mnie chwałą otacza, a który, o którym wy mówicie, jest naszym Bogiem. Lecz wy go nie poznaliście, ja go jednak znam. Gdybym powiedział, że go nie znam, byłbym podobnie jak wy kłamcą, ale ja go znam i słowa jego zachowuję. Abraham, ojciec wasz, rozradował się z tego, że ujrzał mój dzień, ujrzał go i ucieszył się. Na to rzekli do niego Żydzi, pięćdziesiąt lat jeszcze nie masz, a Abrahama widziałeś. Rzekł do nich Jezus, Zaprawdę, zaprawdę powiadam wam, zanim Abraham stał się, ja jestem. Porwali więc kamienia, aby je rzucić na niego. Jezus jednak ukrył się 
i wyszedł ze świątyni. Oto Słowo Boże. Niech Twój święty duch dziś przenika mnie i niech zawsze już gości w duszy me. Święty przyjdź i niech spłynie deszcz błogosławieństwy. Ojcze, obmyj mnie, Duchu Święty przyjdź, Duchu Święty Działaj z mocą w nas, Duchu Święty, przemień smutku czas, tak niech spłynie deszcz, błogosławieństwy, Ojcze, Panie Jezu, dziękujemy Ci za Twoje słowa. Pragniemy trwać przy Tobie, pragniemy podążać za Twoim słowem, pragniemy wsłuchiwać się w Twoje słowo, bo Twoje słowo jest prawdą i Twoje słowo jest życiem. Ty jesteś życiem, Jezu. Panie Jezu, oddajemy Ci dzisiaj nasze spotkanie, aby w tym spotkaniu oddać Ci chwałę, aby wszystko to, co nasze, abyśmy umieli zostawić wszystko to, co nasze i podążać tylko za Tobą słuchać Twojej woli i iść tam, dokąd nas posyłasz. Panie Jezu, oddajemy Ci to spotkanie. Ty jesteś w centrum tego spotkania. Spotykamy się tutaj dla Ciebie, aby oddać Tobie chwałę, aby powiedzieć Ci, Jezu, że Ty jesteś naszym Królem, że Ty jesteś naszym Panem. Błogosławieństwy Ojcze, obmyj mnie Duchu Święty przyjdź I niech spłynie deszcz Błogosławieństwy Ojcze, obmyj mnie Duchu Święty Drodzy bracia i siostry, pragnę Was zaprosić teraz do modlitwy. Pomódlmy się, zaprosimy Ducha Świętego, pomódlmy się do Niego o to, aby odeszły od nas wszelkiego rodzaju smutki, aby jeżeli są trudne sytuacje w naszym życiu, abyśmy umieli je jakoś razem sprostać z Chrystusem, abyśmy byli w tym wszystkim, wszystkim radośni, aby odeszły od nas wszelkie smutki. Jeżeli ktoś jest smutny, niech to odejdzie. Jeżeli ktoś jest teraz być może zalękniony, może wystraszony, czegoś się boi, niech te lęki odejdą. Pomódlmy się, aby, aby nasi bracia i siostry, którzy mają problemy, ujrzeli Chrystusa, ujrzeli, ujrzeli światło w tunelu, że jest nadzieja, bo Jezus jest nadzieją, Jezus jest wszystkim, co mamy i Jezus jest dobry, Jezus jest miłością. Przyjdź, Duchu Święty. Duchu Święty, oddajemy Ci wszystko to, co jest w nas słabe, wszystkie nasze słabości, wszystkie nasze namiętności. Oddajemy Ci to, co nas przeraża. Oddajemy Ci to, co sprawia, że jesteśmy smutni. Niech w imię Twoje, Duchu Święty, teraz odejdzie wszystko. Jezu, w imię Twoje niech odejdzie teraz wszelki lęk, niech odejdzie wszelka obawa. 
Niech tam, gdzie jest smutek, nastąpi teraz radość w imię Twoje, Jezu Chryste. Niechaj wszystkie nasze serca się rozradują Twoją obecnością. Niech wszystko, co, co jest chore, zostanie uzdrowione. Wszystko to, co na naszej duszy jest ciężkie, niech teraz będzie łatwiejsze do uniesienia. Jezu, w Twoje imię, w Twoje imię rozkazuję, aby to wszystko odeszło, to, co jest trudne, abyśmy umieli przejrzeć, abyśmy umieli spojrzeć naprawdę, abyśmy umieli stanąć w prawdzie, Jezu. Obywam nas wszystkich przy Najświętszą Krwią Twoją. Chowam nas, Jezu, w Twoich ranach. Chwała Tobie, Ojcze. Amen. Pragniemy Cię dzisiaj uwielbić we wszystkich naszych relacjach. Przede wszystkim pamiętając o tym, że nasza relacja z Tobą i dbanie o nią jest najważniejszą na tym świecie, jest najważniejszą relacją w naszym całym życiu. To jest, co powinniśmy pielęgnować każdego dnia, o każdej porze. Panie, ale dzisiaj pragniemy Ci podziękować za wszystkie nasze relacje międzyludzkie, Pragnę Ci podziękować, Panie, za to, że nam przypominasz, że one powinny być naprawdę zdrowymi relacjami. 
że żadna relacja nie powinna być ponad tą, która jest między nami a Tobą, Panie Jezu. Pragniemy Ci przede wszystkim dzisiaj, Panie Jezu, podziękować za wszystkie trudne relacje w naszym życiu, bo te, nad którymi nie trzeba bardzo dużo pracować, przychodzą nam z łatwością, ale te, nad którymi naprawdę trzeba poświęcić czas i pracować, to są relacje, w których, Panie, musimy używać tej miłości, którą wlewasz w nasze serca. To, jest, to są relacje, które w nas wyrabiają pokorę, cierpliwość i miłość do drugiego człowieka. Pragniemy Cię, Panie Boże, dzisiaj w tych relacjach właśnie uwielbić. Pragniemy Cię, Panie, właśnie w tych relacjach wywyższyć Twoje przynajświętsze imię. Pragniemy Ci właśnie, Panie Boże, dzisiaj za te relacje podziękować, bo choć one są trudne, one, Panie, pochodzą od Ciebie, dlatego że nie ma przypadków, nie ma przypadkowych relacji, przypadkowych ludzi, których stawiasz na drodze naszego życia. Dlatego Ci serdecznie, serdecznie dziękujemy za nie i wywyższamy Cię, nasz Boże, nasz Królu, nasz Zbawco. Chwała Ci, Panie.
Przyślij im swojego ducha pocieszyciela, aby byli radośni. Stań na ich drodze. Daj im radość, której potrzebują. Potrzebują Ciebie, Panie. Może nie potrafią się odpoźnić na Twoją miłość, ale bardzo Ciebie potrzebują. Bo każde serce potrzebuje Jezusa. Ty możesz przyjść pod mocz zamkniętych, tak jak przyjdziesz do wieczernika. Przyjdź teraz do tych ludzi, dotknij. Odbij życie, ustrój ich. Napełnij serca miłością. Przyjdź, Panie Jezu. Przyjdź, Jezu. Jezus jest swoim Panem, tak? Zapraszam na środek, podejdźmy bliżej do Jezusa. Być świadectwo odwagi, świadectwo wiary. Podejdźmy do Jezusa, to do Jezusa idziemy. Kochani, zapraszam, podejdźmy bliżej. Zatańczmy dla Pana, zaśpiewajmy dla Niego. On jest naszym Panem. salvation. You are the beginning and the end. Everything that we have, we have in you. Our strength, our life, 
our wealth, everything we have in you, in your holy name, Jesus. And we're here today to praise you. We are here to joyfully say, Lord, you are my king. Jesus, you are my God. I love you. Brothers and sisters, did you have a chance to say, Jesus, I love you? Did you tell him that today? Open your hearts. Open your hearts to Jesus. Let him in. Invite him. Invite him to your life because he is almighty. He is most high. There is no one. There is no one like him. There is no one like you, Jesus. And we are inviting you to our lives. Inviting you to our work, to our families. Be our king. Be our God. Because you are the most high. We praise you. We adore you, Lord. We adore you, Jesus. We adore your holy name, Jesus.
Ty jesteś naszym Panem, Ty jesteś dobrym pasterzem. Jezu, Ty zostawiasz, e, nie zostawiasz owcy, która, która zginie, nie zostawiasz jej samej, ale idziesz i szukasz. Jezu, Ty oddałeś swoje życie na krzyżu za nas, abyśmy my mogli żyć, abyśmy mieli życie w pełni, abyśmy mogli odziedziczyć Twoje Królestwo. Ty jesteś naszym dobrym Ojcem, Ty jesteś naszym Panem. To Ty nas nazwałeś swoimi przyjaciółmi, Ty nas nazwałeś swoimi dziećmi. Jezu, niechaj Twoja obecność wypełnia nasze serca, niech Twoja obecność odmienia nasze serca, odmienia nasze życie, abyśmy byli pełni odwagi i radości, abyśmy zanosili to wszystko, co nam przekazujesz do drugiego człowieka, abyśmy Ciebie nieśli drugiemu człowiekowi. Jezu, kochamy Cię. Bądź wywyższony. Panie Boże, stajemy teraz przed Tobą, pragniemy Ci serdecznie podziękować, pragniemy Cię uwielbić w tym świętym czasie Wielkiego Postu. W czasie Wielkiego Postu, który nam Panie dajesz, abyśmy mogli z, z refleksją popatrzeć na naszą codzienność, na nasze życia, na to jakie prowadzimy na nasze relacje. Panie Boże, pragniemy Cię dzisiaj uwielbić w tym szczególnym czasie, 
w tym wielkim poście, gdzie musimy teraz siedzieć w domach, jesteśmy do tego zmuszeni i dziękujemy Ci Panie za to, że szczególnie właśnie w tym czasie Ty pragniesz nas przybliżyć do siebie, że szczególnie w tym czasie Panie Ty chcesz nam pokazać jak bardzo Ty nas kochasz bez względu na nasze życia, na naszą przeszłość, na to, co się w nas dzieje. Ty, Panie, chcesz nam pokazać, jak bardzo Ty nas kochasz. Dziękujemy Ci, Panie, za to, że, że jesteś, że jesteś naszym Ojcem, że chcesz być tak blisko nas, za to, że, Panie, umarłeś na krzyżu za nas, za nasze grzechy, za wszystkie nasze przewinienia. Pragniemy Ciebie dzisiaj uwielbić, Panie, w tym czasie, w tym czasie Wielkiego Postu. Bądź uwielbiony, bądź wywyższony, nasz Królu i Zbawco. Chwała Tobie, Jezu. Święty czas. Niech Pan obdarza nas wszystkich swoim błogosławieństwem. Pan z Wami i z Duchem Twoim. Niech Was błogosławi Bóg Wszechmogący, Ojciec i Syn i Duch Święty. Amen. Szczęść Boże. Boże mój, o święty, święty jesteś Ty. Jakże wspaniały jesteś Ty. Boże mój, jakże wspaniałe dzieła Twe. Boże mój, jakże cudowne imię Twe. Boże mój, o święty, święty jesteś Ty. Pełen miłości, miłosierdzia, łaskawości. Świętości jesteś Ty, Boże mój, Ojcze mój. Pełen miłości, miłosierdzia, łaskawości i świętości. Boże mój, jakże cudowne imię Twe, 
cross and be raised. But at the same time, you know, just as I read through that, I was, you know, I think it should move us to compassion. There should be a compassion that wells up in our hearts for those that suffer, for those that, you know, have difficulties, those that are, you know, poor financially or even suffer in all sorts of ways, illnesses, sicknesses. There should be a sorrow in our hearts and a love, right? Not necessarily pity, but a love, genuine love for people. And it should well up, which did not happen in the case of this rich man. He had no sense of even recognizing the existence of Lazarus. He didn't even notice him. Here he was, ready to lap up the the scraps from his table, but the rich man had no even sense that he was even there. Right? It wasn't until after he died he begins to realize what has happened and, you know, and uh, kind of uh, wakes up to all of that. But how often, you know, do the poor and the suffering, they're all around us and we ourselves don't see, we don't notice. You know, I think in the time of Israel as well, there was a whole sense, because of the whole promises of the Lord, there was a promise of new land, that the Lord would bring the Israelites into a new land flowing with milk and honey. There was a sense in the Old Testament that if you were prosperous, if you had these material goods, then you were blessed by God. You were blessed. If you were poor, it was a sign that God wasn't with you, that the favor of the Lord wasn't with you, right? So this was a bit the thinking of that time. But Jesus turns that right around. He turns that right around and he shows that the rich man is not really in the good favor of the Lord. And in fact, it is the poor man himself that, you know, is, is able to inherit eternal life. You know, so some of that, uh, you might say, prosperity gospel, uh, which we see sometimes even today, oftentimes with some of the Protestant congregations, evangelicals, a kind of a prosperity gospel. You know, we see Jesus essentially doing a correction for some of that uh, with the Israelites at that time with his own preaching. You know, but, uh, you know, it should move us um, for sure. At the same time, as I was reflecting on that, I'm thinking as well, I've just finished up a parish mission. Lent is a very busy time for me because I have a whole bunch of parish missions. So I parachute into a parish and preach for a few nights. I just finished up a mission last night at Mary Star of the Sea. So I've been preaching for two weeks straight. So I'm worn out a little bit. But I've been preaching all about the new evangelization. You know, the church, God is doing something new today in the church. There was a kind of uh, approach to the faith that came out of the Protestant Reformation back in the 16th century. And what happened is among the Catholics, the, the faith became more of a private matter. There was a bit of a fear of speaking about our faith publicly because, you know, or, or even talking and learning about our faith because we might be drawn away from the Catholic Church into the Protestant denominations. So the church kind of had this bit of a fortress mentality. We were kind of protecting ourselves. We were, uh, in, in a sense, it was more me and Jesus. It was my, my, my thing with Jesus. It, we, we kind of lost connection, I think, in some ways with the mission of the church. Now we see some great mission work going on over the last three, four hundred years, especially with some of the religious communities and some of the evangelistic efforts, you know, to go to the uh, Africa and other countries to do evangelistic type ministry, you know, but, but this was often the priests and it was the religious communities, but among the lay people, there hasn't been a huge movement you know, until this last, you know, uh, I think number of, of, of decades here where God is beginning to awaken among the lay people in the church this essential call, this essential duty to reach out to the lost. Like, you know, this, uh, this uh, Lazarus who's lost. Not everybody is materially lost. Not everybody is materially poor. But as one uh, you know, friend of mine often says, this world today, there are many people that are spiritually in poverty. They're spiritually uh, 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 you know, empty because they've not come to know Jesus. 
They've not come to know who Jesus is because nobody has proclaimed the gospel to them. Nobody has brought Jesus to those that are lost. And this is the job of the church. And in fact, Pope Paul VI in his letter on evangelization in the early 70s, he says, the church exists to evangelize. The church exists to bring good news to the poor. I heard someone say it's actually the church is the only institution in the world that essentially exists for non-members. We exist for people that don't actually come to church on Sunday. We exist to bring that message out into the world to the lost, the broken, the unchurched, eh? those that are are yet to come in the doors of the church. You know, but we kind of think, well, if I come to Sunday Mass and I put my hour in, I'm a good Catholic. I do my hour, I clock my tag, and, you know, all of a sudden one day I'm going to get into heaven. You know, and that's our measuring stick. And I'm not downplaying the Eucharist because it's the source. The catechism says it's the source of our strength. And it's the summit. It's the Mount Everest. It's like the high peak of communion or union with God in the Holy Eucharist. And it is a a representing and an entering into the Paschal mystery where Jesus is offered to the Father. You know, the Eucharist is the most powerful gift that God has given to us. You know, but the gift of the Eucharist is not the same as the mission of the church. The mission of the church is to bring Jesus out into the world. And we do that by getting filled at the table of the Lord. We do that by coming to Jesus and getting transformed in the Eucharistic feast, in the Word of God, where we're changed, we're healed, we're freed, we're delivered, and then we have something to give away. We have Jesus living in us and now we can go out to our neighbors. We can go out to the marketplace. We can go to the poor in the streets and we can begin to share Jesus the Lord. And that's our mission. I think when we stand before the Lord on judgment day, you know, the Lord's, he he, he probably is going to ask us about mass attendance. I'm not saying he's not going to ask us about mass attendance. I actually don't know that it's a questionnaire, you know, but anyways, if it were, you know, kind of a a report, you know, one question might be, you know, have you shared your faith with anyone? Have you brought the gospel into the world? Have you proclaimed Christ to the lost and the poor? Or have you just, you know, kept your faith all private and never shared it with anybody? You know, I think that's one of the questions I don't think our judgment is just going to be on mass attendance. It's going to be on the mission. The church exi- if the church exists to evangelize, if we exist to proclaim the gospel, surely that has to play into our evaluation when God is assessing the fruitfulness in each of our lives, right, of our lives, of our Christian faith. Hey, what does St. James say? Faith without works is dead, right? Faith without works is dead. Anyways, boy, you're all quiet. You should be all saying, amen, amen, amen. How come? Am I too hard on you? Or is it just because it's Thursday night and everybody's tired? Or am I yelling too loud? I don't know. Hey, or maybe how many, how many are understanding English? That's another whole question, right? Right? About half, right? Okay. So that's a little bit of it too. Hey, but this is our this is our mission. This is our call. Right? And 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 I think unless we understand that, unless we get that, we're not gonna get what God is doing with the Holy Spirit today. Because God is lavishing the Holy Spirit upon the church. God is igniting a new fire in the hearts of Catholics and Christians throughout the world. God is birthing something new. But again, it's not so that we just go up in the upper room and just, you know, stay there in the upper room for the rest of our life. You know, it's like, it's like the apostles when they went up to the Mount of Transfiguration and they saw this, you know, Abraham and uh, Elijah or whoever it was, Moses and Elijah up on the, the mountain, right? What did Peter say? Hey, let's build a few huts and stick around here, right? 
Let's stay. This is nice. This is a nice place. It's so comfortable up here. This is great. We've just had this heavenly vision. It's glorious. You know? What did Jesus, all of a sudden it all ended and he said, okay, now we got to go down the hill. We got to go back into the world because we got a work to do. I have to go to the cross. I have to go and carry the cross for the sins of humanity. We can't just stay on Mount Transfiguration. We can't just stay around the table of the Lord. We got to go out and transform the world. We got to go bring the gift of Christ to the world. Amen. And so, too, I think one of the challenges with the charismatics is we discover the prayer meeting. And it's lovely, and it's a little bit like Mount Transfiguration, and we we, we just want to hang out at the prayer meeting for the rest of our life. And if we're doing that, we're not getting it. We're not getting the essential purpose of the prayer meeting. The prayer meeting is to light a fire in us. It's to get us excited. It's to get us discovering the gifts that God has given us. Again, not so I can say, wow, I got all these gifts. It's so that we can use the gifts. So that we can go out and heal the sick. We can go out and prophesy over people. We can go out and preach the gospel. We can go out and teach the people. All these gifts of the Holy Spirit are not for us. They're for the mission of the church. They're to bring Christ into the world. Amen? (sighs) I'm getting excited. Amen. You know, in the sacristy, I was hoping Father Matthias would be showing up because I was going to ask him to do the preaching because I didn't have anything to say. (sighs) But the Lord seems to have given me a thought or two. So anyways, you know, this is the call of God and the church. And I, I, I share all this because God is doing this today. He's awakening the Holy Spirit for this new missionary thrust. And that missionary thrust and movement has to be coming from the lay people. It has to be coming from the baptized laity. If you're waiting for the priests to do all the ministry and mission, you're going to wait for a long time. If you wait for the religious to do it, you're going to wait forever. That's not what God is doing today. It's the age of the laity, the third millennium. I heard someone say that a while ago. The first millennium was the age of the bishops. You know, maybe the bishops and the priests. The second millennium, the second thousand years was all about the religious communities, the Dominicans, Franciscans, Jesuits, all these religious communities that went to the ends of the earth. The third millennium, it's time for the laity. Okay, the bishops and the priests and the religious, they didn't get it done. Now the lay people have to stand up. Hey, now it's your turn as lay people. Get up, get up, right? Assume your baptism. You've been given this, this great gift in your baptism. Eh? And your mission, you know what? Your mission to go out and evangelize the world, where does it come from? It's rooted in your baptism. It's rooted in your baptism. You don't have to wait for your parish priest to say, please go out and share Jesus in the world. It's rooted in your baptism. If you are baptized, you have been called, you have been commissioned. It's in you already, that call, that vocation, that mission. It's rooted in your baptism. So all you have to do is be who you are and go out and bring Christ. You know, now that's not easy. How do we do that? It's going to take a whole learning curve. We probably need to do seminars on how to share Jesus in the world. I'm not telling you how to do it. That's a big project. Maybe we need courses on that. How do I effectively share Jesus with others, right? We don't want to shove it down people's throats. We want to invite. In the past, there's been coercion involved in evangelism. We don't want to get into all that. We want to propose. We propose the gospel. First, we live it. When we live the gospel, when people see the joy of the Lord in our hearts, the peace of Christ in us, the love of God flowing out of us, there should be something in them that sees you and says, wow, there's something different about you. Tell me, why are you so happy all the time? Why are you so peaceful all the time? Why are you so loving? 
People should see the Holy Spirit flowing through you and it should cause them to ask questions and they should come to you. Did you hear the story of my dad? I, I, you've not been to my parish missions. I tell all my parish missions people, my dad, a number of years ago, my dad bought an old hotel when I was 19. It had a bar and a tavern in. That wasn't really good for my spiritual life. At the time, there were lots of spirits in there, but not much of the Holy Spirit. Anyways, so I was, I, I, I was there for a number of years. Anyways, I, I, I ended up you know, discern. I, I encountered the Lord. You know, in my when I was 22, 23 years of age, and then started feeling a call to head off to the seminary. So, in 25 years of age, I went off to the seminary. Well, my dad, I kind of left him high and dry because he had bought this old hotel, planning to fix it up or develop the property. And here he was. I was a carpenter contractor. I was doing all his work on the building of renovating it all. Anyways, anyways, yes. I got frustrated at times because he'd go hang out with the prayer group ladies having coffee and I'd be working in the whole hotel fixing up the hotel. Anyways, that's another story. But dad, you know, one day he started praying and he was saying, Lord, you know, you've taken my carpenter away to the seminary and you know I got to do some work on the hotel. Could you please send me someone? Could you send me someone? And, and so he was praying and asking and a couple days later some guy showed up at the hotel. And he says, you know what, I happen to be traveling across Canada and I've run out of money. But he says, you know, I'm a carpenter. I'd be willing to work it off if you would put a roof over my head and give me a room. And so my dad said, yeah, great deal. He saw it as an answer to prayer. And he put this guy to work. And they worked for a couple weeks on the hotel, fixing something up, you know. And, but at the same time, my dad was just in love with the Lord. And, and this hotel, we had about 30 apartments in the hotel. It was more like a, a rooming house apartment building than a hotel. But anyways, we had about 30 rooms in there. And my dad was constantly doing ministry with a lot of these people Often, a lot of the clientele were street people. They were, they were really the poor, you might say, in our culture. A lot of them on welfare. Uh, and the hotel was more run down. So here my dad was. But my dad just loved on them every day. And, and a lot of people would come see my dad every day. And he'd pray with them. He'd counsel them. He'd share his faith with them. Whatever it was. I tell you, my dad taught me a whole lot about evangelization just by watching him every day do that. Well, this carpenter there was working and I guess probably saw this stuff going on that my dad was doing in terms of sharing the Lord with others. At some point, he went up to my dad and said, Vic, I got to talk to you for a minute or two, you know, or for, for, for a few minutes. And, and, and my dad was busy doing something. He says, can it wait? And he said, no. And he grabbed my dad by the shoulders and he said to my dad, Vic, tell me about this Jesus guy you know. And I thought, wow, you know, like this guy, this carpenter saw something in my dad. He saw something that was different. And he thought, wow, I want some of that. What is it you got? You know, and he had probably heard this name of Jesus. You know, we are in a time when there are people out there in our world and our society and in Toronto that don't know who Jesus is. Never heard of him. A lot of them coming from other countries and stuff like that. You know, we're in an opportunity for new evangelization, even right, right in our midst. You know, so that silent witness, this is Pope Paul VI says, the first evangelization is a silent witness of our life. But the second evangelization, Pope Paul VI said, be always ready to share the message of the faith. Be always ready to talk about Jesus, to tell, to speak good news into someone's life, right? And so... Um, we can talk about the love of God. We can talk about the plan of God for someone in their life. We can talk about the friendship God wants to have with us. You know, when people are suffering, we can invite them to, you know, come to Jesus for healing, whatever it is. But another thing we can always do is share our testimony, share our story, you know, and that's a powerful little bit of dynamite, you know. It's a powerful tool in our tool belt. What is your story? Maybe I'll end my homily with this. Are we in a rush? Not really, eh? Not in a rush. So anyways, what was I talking about? The, 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 the testimony. You know, this is a beautiful way we share the Lord in the world. And I would say, you know, what does St. Peter say? Be always ready to give 
a reason for your faith, a reason for your faith. And that's your, that's your testimony. Why, to me, the most powerful reason I have for sharing the Lord is that God has done something in my life. God has changed me. I lived it up in the pubs for many years and I was not happy. I lived a selfish life for a long time. I was not happy. I was miserable and I had no purpose in my life. And then when, I, when my dad began to share faith with me and invite me to open my heart to God, you know, I wasn't too excited about that right off the bat, but over a few months he just kept on inviting me for coffee and lunch breaks and he kept telling me that Jesus loved me and God loved me and I could have a relationship with, with Jesus and a friendship. And if I would open my heart, God would draw close to me. You know, and, and maybe he had some plan for my life. My dad just kept speaking this into my life. And I, over a period of a couple months, I began to believe what he was saying was true. And I began to pray. And what happened as I began to pray, God showed up. God began to draw close to me. I began to experience God in my life. And I'll tell you, I've been on a great adventure with the Lord ever since. Amen? But God changed my life. That's my testimony. That's my story. There was a time I was not living for Jesus and it wasn't going well for me. Now that I'm living for the Lord, you know, there's a great joy in my heart. You know, and God has been taking me on a wonderful, wonderful journey. And I have a best friend now. And it's Jesus. Hey. He's Jesus, and I can talk every day with the Lord, and I can ask him for guidance, and I know he's got my back, and he's there to strengthen me. And what a gift that is. You know, don't just keep that to yourself. You know, find out what your story is. What has God done for you in your life? Is there something that you can give thanks to God for? Maybe that's your story. Usually there's a kind of B.C., before Christ, you know, an encounter moment and then what life is like now living with Jesus. Usually we can identify that, but not always. Sometimes people just kind of come into the faith in childhood and they just always follow the Lord. That was Billy Graham's story. Have you heard of Billy Graham? Great evangelist. He's done altar calls around the world. Someone once asked Billy Graham, Billy Graham, when did you do your altar call? When did you give your life to Jesus? And he thought about it. He says, I don't think I ever did. He says, you know what? I was taught about Jesus when I was a child and I just believed from day one. And, and he says, I've just followed Jesus from day one. There's never been a point in my life where I felt I turned away from God or walked away from the Lord. I've always been close to Jesus. And, and, and you know, so I don't know that I needed to make an altar call. So not everybody has a prodigal son story, you know, but there's got to be some story that we have of why you why we follow Jesus why we love Jesus amen you know we got to figure out what that is and be ready ready to tell people about that are you do you just follow Jesus because your parents did do you follow Jesus because your grandparents followed Jesus do you go to mass because your great grandparents followed Jesus back through the generations or have you at some point in your life made your own decision as an adult to say I'm going to follow Jesus if you've made your own decision as an adult to say I'm going to be a follower of Jesus there's got to be a reason that's your testimony that's your story and we got to be ready to share that with people and proclaim the gospel and heal the sick and prophesy over people and all of that anyways I need a whole week with you to teach on evangelization. I can't really do that tonight, so I'm going to have to land the plane. But I just wanted to, you know, I, I guess, you know, what the Lord would have me to do tonight is just put a little taste in your mouth. God is doing a new thing today in the church. He's awakening among the laity a movement for a new evangelization in the world. And he wants everyone on board. He wants everybody in the game. You could imagine an arena, a sporting event, where 20,000 people are spectators in the stands and there's 20 people out on the field. That's not how the Christian faith is meant to be lived. The 20,000 people need to be on the field. 
Amen? The 20,000 need to be on the field doing the work of the kingdom, bringing Christ to the lost. Don't be a spectator Christian. Don't be on the sidelines or just hanging out in the upper room you know, or even around the table of the Lord all day. The church exists to evangelize. We exist to go out, come down the mountain, and bring the love of God into the world. You know, may God anoint us powerfully. May he anoint us with new Pentecost so we can truly, you know, do that work that Christ has entrusted to the church. If we don't do that, who will do it? If we are not the hands of Jesus, the feet of Jesus, the mouth of Jesus, the ears of the Lord, who's going to do it? It is the job of the church to rise up in this generation and do the work of Jesus in the world. Amen?